You know, radiation is one hell of a boogeyman because you simply can't escape it. You're bathed in radiation 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's called the background radiation. And the more of it you're exposed to, the more likely you are to die of cancer. So radiation like this is kind of like driving. The more of it you do, the more likely you are to die in a car crash. Or in the case of radiation, the more likely you are to die from cancer. There is no safe limit. There is only acceptable risks. So, for instance, we know how many road miles are driven each year in America and how many people die. We can therefore get a reasonable estimate of your chances of dying per mile driven on the road. And similarly for radiation. So let's compare these two hazards. The average background radiation you're exposed to each year gives you about the same chance of dying from cancer as driving 1,000 miles gives you from dying in a road accident. And seeing as your average American drives over 10,000 miles per year, this would mean that you could live in an area with 10 times the background radiation. And even at that, you would only have a comparable chance of dying from cancer as you would have from dying in a car accident on the roads. Now, keeping that in mind, let's step back a year or two and take a look at the news articles when the USS Ronald Reagan was first subjected to the radiation cloud from Fukushima. The US Navy's 7th Fleet says 17 crew members have been exposed to low levels of radiation that was released from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The crew was on three helicopters from the aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan. They were conducting rescue operations outside Sendai City. According to the 7th Fleet, they were detected with low levels of contamination. But it says the radioactive materials can easily be removed with soap and water. The DOD says the maximum potential radiation dose for personnel on the ship was less than one month's exposure to natural background radiation from rocks, soil and sun. And the very low levels of residual radioactivity that did deposit on the ship were mitigated and controlled. It has not detected any more contamination. Which sounds about right to me. I mean, let's just say you have a burning core for sake of argument. Most of that will settle out locally. And by the time you're 50 miles away, it's obviously going to be significantly less. There is a limit to how irradiated you can get by flying a helicopter around 50 miles north of the reactor. Now let's see how this is being reported at the moment. Now a group of U.S. Navy veterans are saying exposure to leaking radiation from the plant has made them sick. Some of the first responders in Japan after the tsunami and earthquake are now developing serious health issues because of the Fukushima nuclear reactor. The nuclear power plant meltdown in Fukushima, Japan in March of 2011 not only contaminated many Jap Japanese citizens there, but dozens of U.S. sailors as well. They were there to help in the rescue effort, but now many are suffering serious symptoms of radiation sickness, sickness with no acknowledgement of the connection from the Defense Department and no diagnosis from their doctors. I believe we just showed you the radioactive snow and I mean you saw how much it was. I mean they're literally surrounded by the radioactive material so it's understandable why so many of the guys on the aircraft carrier and women got so sick. Ken, nuclear fallout ain't nothing to mess with. Oh come on Chink, you think that's radioactive snow? Look, when the plant blew up it was mostly a hydrogen oxygen chemical explosion. It wasn't a nuke going off that irradiated tons of ash and sucked it miles into the air. What you're looking at here isn't radioactive snow. It's people scrubbing the deck with soap and water. For the bloody obvious reason that if you get radioactive dust on top of your ship, you get irradiated by it. However, if you wash it overboard, you don't. These are obvious and very standard decontamination procedures. I mean, we're not coming at this blind. We actually know quite a lot about the hazards of radiation on ships thanks to experiments like this. Further, the aircraft carrier is a nuclear aircraft carrier with two nuclear power plants on board. It's a multi-billion dollar vessel with billions of dollars more in aircraft. Doubtless, they will have very good monitoring on those nuclear power plants and throughout the ship for damage control. For this massive irradiation of the ship to have happened, it would require that the nuclear safety officers, who typically have a pretty good grasp of the hazards of radiation, to sit on their hands while very sensitive radiation alarms would be going off all around them. And or for the captain to sit on his hands while a multi-billion dollar ship 
himself and his entire crew got needlessly irradiated. That they were drinking contaminated water that was fed into the ship from the sea. Now you can see a sailor here in the middle of that in the middle of that water as the flight deck was being decontaminated. But that wasn't actually the biggest problem. From my reading of the case, it appears the biggest problem was that the radiation was in the water, mm -hmm. and they take the water in and desalinate it, and then use it in the faucets, the showers, etc. So they were all showering, literally showering in that radioactive water, and that's why this happened. But what about this radiation getting into the drinking water? Well, as many of you will know, you can't just drink seawater. It's too salty. You need to remove that salt somehow. And desalination on a ship like this is probably done with reverse osmosis, where a device uses pressure and a membrane to filter out the salt ions from the water. That is, any dust would certainly be removed by this process. Now, the majority of the radioactivity will come in the form of radioactive ions, which are uh, then dissolved from the dust into the water. But the desalination will remove those ions from the water, at least as well as it removes the sodium chloride ions, which is, of course, what you've got to remove to stop the seawater from being salty. After that, it's only tritium you've got to worry about. But then again, why would tritium be settling out in a dust cloud? Put simply, virtually all of the radioactive dust and the radioactive ions in the water would have been removed by the filtration process. Now, to be honest, I don't know that much about the specs of their water purification units, but if they had any sense, they would also be fitted with radiation monitors. Why? Because if someone does try and nuke your ships, as was probably in mind when they were designing these things, and by some miracle you survive by a near miss or something, you will need to make sure that your water purifiers are working properly and that they're not letting in radioactive water. Then of course you've got to consider the specs of the ship and of the radioactive plume. The further you get away from a plume, the plume of course gets larger and therefore more diluted. And to get a decent whack from it, you would need to be pretty close. So the concentrated plume is unlikely to be more than a mile or two wide, depending on the wind conditions. However, the USS Ronald Reagan can cruise at about 30 miles per hour, which means it could sail across a plume that size in about five minutes. I, I mean, I just somehow doubt the conversation on the bridge went something like this. Uh, where should I park, Captain? Oh, yeah, we should park downwind of that burning nuclear reactor. Oh, and of course be sure to maneuver the ship to account for changes in wind direction. And then finally, I found this news report from a few years back that says the aircraft carrier was over 100 miles away from the reactor at the time. The aircraft carrier was at sea about 160 kilometers northeast of the plant. A hydrogen blast occurred at one of its reactors on Saturday. The US Navy says the Ronald Reagan and other 7th Fleet ships have been relocated. You've also got to be a little careful about not being misled by what you see in pictures like this. Remember that when these reactors blew up, it was a hydrogen-oxygen explosion like this. These are simple chemical explosions. They blew off the outer containment of the reactor, and the majority of what you're looking at here is just the outer containment being blown up. What should be most worrying about this is that previously, all the leaks would have been contained within that outer containment. And now that it's been blown off, the radioactive material can leak directly out into the environment. So I really wouldn't be so much guided by how dark and sinister the cloud looks like, because that's not how radiation works. What you should really base this on is the readings on the Geiger counter. And 100 miles away on the USS Ronald Reagan, I'm pretty sure their nuclear safety officers would be saying exactly the same things. Lastly, the symptoms they're describing are just utterly inconsistent with radiation exposure. Look, if you get a massive whack of radiation, you die from radiation sickness. And that happens fairly quickly in a few days to a few weeks, that sort of thing. If you survive the radiation sickness, you live on pretty much as normal, albeit with a higher chance of cancer. It's explained at some length in this video. If you like this, look, they said that they knew fairly early on, but they couldn't get the aircraft carrier out in enough days, right? Because people got so sick, everybody on board started having uncontrollable diarrhea. They said they were, and I hate to put it this way, but that's literally a quote, shitting themselves in the hallways. Oh my God. Like, and so. Now that sounds consistent with radiation sickness. But the problem is that if your radiation sickness is so acute that it'll give you diarrhea, 
it also has a bloody good chance of killing you. That is, if the 5,000 strong crew had been subjected to doses large enough to induce radiation sickness bad enough to give you diarrhea, you would be looking at an acute radiation poisoning death toll in hundreds to thousands, whereas the actual death toll was zero. Look, how many people get diarrhea on a warship with a complement of 5,000? Is that even remotely surprising? What makes you think it was radiation that actually caused this, given how easy it is to detect radiation on a nuclear aircraft carrier? However, the bottom line is none died. And three years later on, if you're going to claim that this is radiation induced, it's cancer or nothing. Yet these are some of the symptoms that they are describing. I have this degenerative disease in my lower back and um, I have no family history of it. Um, and I have no uh, accident that could have caused it. And um, I have some digestion problems as, as well um, and stomach pain. Right now I have a lot of weight issues and thyroid issues, issues that I didn't have before I came in and issues that I didn't have after I had my child. Um. Sure, that's not a nice place to be in, but it's not cancer. Look, the USS Ronald Reagan has about 5,000 personnel on it, and over a period of about three years, how many of them do you think will get sick after extended stays in a large metal box with lots of other people? which does carry its own risks, as Maya cynically describes here. New rule! Cruise ships have to be renamed Floating Death Traps. <laughs> <laughs> if your friends could see you now, they turn away in horror as sharks devour your carcass and then develop some strange virus that no one has ever heard of. The thing that really clinches this for me, though, is just how reluctant these people are to put numbers on it. If you know the radiation exposure, you can get a pretty good estimate of the cancer rates. The best I've seen is that levels of 300 times background were recorded, well, okay, 300 times background on, say, a two-hour mission, followed by decontamination when they get off. That's about the same radiation as one month of regular background radiation, which is about what the Navy reported at the time. And a month of background radiation is about the same hazard as driving 100 miles. Yet even though all of these would have been measured by the USS Ronald Reagan, for some strange reason, the lawyers seem unwilling to disclose the numbers, blaming everything on the Japanese not telling them stuff. The thrust of our case is that these people were never warned about the true situation on the ground and the fact that they would be entering into a radioactive zone such that they would all receive uh, uh, what's been described as low dose radiation but it was repetitively uh, given to them over days. I mean, so the, uh, the, the thrust of our case is basically that the Tokyo Electric Power Company was operating a facility that they knew was uh, a problem. I mean, what the hell? How much radiation did or didn't leak out of the reactor is almost an irrelevance. The only thing that matters is how much radiation was the crew of the USS Ronald Reagan exposed to. And when you're reduced to listing these as among the list of consequences... I developed gynecological issues. And nobody understood it and they just kept saying stress. I also developed asthma, got bronchitis six times between February and the summer of 2012. And when the actual reporting of the incident is like this. I get my boots checked, there's nothing wrong. I get my hands checked and the Geiger meter just goes crazy. They told everybody to get back, get away from me. That just made me even more nervous and more scared. Dude, if your boots don't set off anything but your hands do, then it just means you've got something on your hands. And I'll bet dollars to donuts that what happened next is they told him to scrub his hands with soap and water. And after they did this, they measured his hands again and they were fine. Which means that your hands were only exposed to radiation while you were on the mission. Just like my hands were only exposed to radiation when they were near this radioactive clock. You'll find, yeah, so that's about seven times background. At this distance, you're getting about seven times background. And if I move it up close, what you'll find is it goes absolutely crazy. 
In fact, if I actually leave it there, what you'll find is it'll bury the needle, um, which means that it's at least 50 times background. It takes a while to integrate out. Yeah, 9.99. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I'll turn that off, so <laughs> keep beeping. Uh, they used a radioactive paint that would glow in the dark. And after my hands moved away from the radiation source, I'm no longer exposed to it. Look, I gotta be honest, this looks far more like an exercise in exporting nuisance lawsuits. And it's more likely to be settled because of the bad press of the case and people's inherent fear of radiation, rather than the validity of the claims. Because while they do have some claimed cases of cancer, you would expect some cases of cancer in a population of 5,000 people over three years. And without the numbers, it's impossible to tell. But when you're listing stuff like this. So the amount of the radiation is still unknown. What we do know is that these young sailors had none of these kinds of medical problems. Now they have back pains, memory loss, fear, anxiety. I have disc degenerative disease in my lower back, and um, I have no family history of it, um, and I have no uh, accident that could have caused it, and um, I have some digestion problems as, as well, um, and stomach pain as well. And trying to attribute that to a minor radiation exposure three years ago. I'm sorry, but you're just talking crap. But hey, if nuisance lawsuits are your things, then try this. Try filing a lawsuit against all of the airlines. When you fly, you get exposed to 30 times the background radiation. Trust me, I just measured it. And with some 800 million passengers per year in America, I'm sure you won't have any problem in finding thousands, tens of thousands of people willing to say that they've got back pain and memory loss and anxiety that they just didn't have before the flight. I know, I know. I too have this unpleasant feeling that many lawyers' eyes will have just lit up with dollar signs at the very thought. And the only causation that can be connected to these medical life-threatening issues is their exposure to radiation in this operation. But the thing I find disturbing throughout all of this Almost every news item I saw, both major and minor, was just wildly off base, reporting what it was essentially a baseless nuisance lawsuit, albeit a baseless nuisance lawsuit with a $3 billion ask tied to it. And they would stress the claims. Very serious symptoms of radiation sickness, sickness. I believe we just showed you the radioactive snow. And I mean, you saw how much it was. I mean, they're literally surrounded by the radioactive material. So it's understandable why so many of the guys on the aircraft carrier and women got so sick. And invariably just simply gloss over the fact that we know what the effects of radiation exposure are on people. And these people are just not describing the symptoms of radiation exposure. Shit, they might as well file their lawsuit against McDonald's and blamed all of their symptoms on food poisoning because they thought a Big Mac they ate when they were 12 tasted fine. It would have been just as valid. And while I'm watching this media circus, I just couldn't help but be reminded of that great Carl Sagan quote. We live in a society that is absolutely dependent on science and technology, yet we have cleverly arranged things so that almost no one understands science and technology. This is a clear prescription for disaster.